with a Bible in your hand. ask you to turn with me and I made the mistake of leaving my office without my reading glasses so bear with me as I squint through these praise God all right amen thank you for the gift Lord as I Turn in the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers, the 13th chapter, Numbers chapter 13, beginning at the 26th verse. There is a story that I want to use as the jumping off point of my message for you today, a message of encouragement about your future. Numbers chapter 13, verse number 26. I'll be reading from the New International Version. And it reads, They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, as I stand here now, Lord, in front of your people, anoint me, Father God, for this task of imparting this story. As we look into the uncertainty of the coming years, and the coming days, and the coming months, Give us a guide today, Father. Put a compass in our spirit. Put, dear God, a decree in our soul so that we do not have any fear of facing tomorrow. For, Lord, we know that you hold today, tomorrow, in all of eternity. As we sung in the watch night service the other night, dear God, we've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. We know many are the afflictions of the righteous and the unrighteous. Many are the anxieties of a world fearful of even their next day, their next breath. But we know you as a God, Lord, who as we say all the time, you are totally in control. And so Lord, help us to put our faith and our trust and our confidence in you. Use this story to encourage somebody's heart today is my prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may take your seat. Those words are the words of Moses and his explanation of the wandering of the children of Israel after they had left bondage in Egypt. If you're familiar with the biblical story of the deliverance of the children of Israel, better known as the Exodus, you will come to know that the children of Israel, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit in the form of the cloud and the pillar of fire, directing Moses as he directed the people, 
He set them free from the bondage of the government of Pharaoh, and he promised them that he would fulfill the promise that he made to their ancestor Abraham when Abraham walked through all of the land, and he said that all of this land that you walk, I will give it to your people, to your descendants. And so here we have part of the story of the children of Israel after they have left Ramses in Egypt, which is the city that they left from. Some of you may be familiar with this story. It is the story of where the children of Israel got to the edge of the promised land. The children of Israel were right there at their inheritance. Those who had left Egypt on their way to this land where somebody described it as a land flowing with milk and honey, their inheritance, they got right there on the edge and lost their blessing. Because when you understand the story, the children of Israel, they had camped at Mount Sinai and they stayed there for about 11 months. And finally, God told them to leave. And when you read the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers is called the book of wandering. Because if you want to read the story about the journey of the children of Israel from Ramses in Egypt until they crossed the Jordan into Jericho, it will be found in the book of Numbers. If you look at the book of Leviticus, you will discover that the children of Israel, even though the book of Leviticus followed the book of Exodus, the children of Israel never moved throughout the entire book of Leviticus. They were at the, the Mount Sinai, and it was there that God gave them the laws. But they find themselves, after wandering now for about less than a year, from Mount Sinai to Cana was less than a two-week journey. If they had walked directly with no interruption from Ramses to Canaan, it would have took them about two weeks. And what started out as a two-week journey ended up a 40-year trek. And it, it, it ended up that way because when they got to a city called Kadesh, some of your Bibles may say Kadesh Barni, when they arrived at Kadesh, which is where they are in Numbers chapter 13, you may know the story. Moses sent out 12 spies to go over into the land where they were headed and check it out. And they went over into the land and they came back with this report. They said, oh, it is just like we were told. The land is just flowing with milk and honey. Oh, the, the, the fruit of giant. Matter of fact, we brought back some grapes, the cluster of which was so large that it took two of us to carry it. Oh, the land is flowing. The promise is there. But they said, but. But there are people over there. There are the Amalekites, there are the Anakites, there's all of the, the Canaanites. There are all these people over there. And so 10 of the 12 spies who brought this report says, we can't claim our inheritance because the people are over there. Joshua and Caleb, which was the other two, says, we can take it. Now, I, I need you to understand something here because there are always spiritual principles that you learn from these stories. These are just not stories as part of a, you know, a story. There are spiritual principles. First of all, God had already promised them the inheritance. God had already told them that he was going to take them they should have put their trust in God. However, what they did was when they got and they looked at their blessing, circumstances arose in their spirit and in their faith that caused them to doubt God or caused them to forget 
what God had said. And so guess what? Twelve went. Ten said we couldn't do it. Those were the but people. And two said that we can take it. And the Bible says that the people listened to the majority. The people listened to the ten who gave a bad report about their future. So I want to talk to you this morning from this thought. And the thought is, how are you responding to the report about your future? How are you responding to the report about your future? Now, what I mean by that is this. We live in a time where COVID is dominating our news. And everywhere you turn, everybody has a different take on the variants and on the uh, when we will get... Uh, hold of this, and, 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 and everybody has a different idea and information about how it affects people this way, who's going to be uh, affected in the future, you know, what next variant is coming out, and, and, and people are somewhat paralyzed with all of this uncertainty and misinformation and, and lack of information to the point that there are a lot of people whose lives have have turned from vibrant living and moving about to paralyzed isolation. There are people who I have heard said they have not left their homes other than to go get groceries since this pandemic started. And then you have doctors and psychologists and everybody talking about the mental condition and mental disease that a lot of people are dealing with because of their isolation. And unfortunately, a lot of those people are Christians. Now, don't get me wrong. Y'all have heard me talk about this issue before. I understand that there are people who need to stay around or stay away from people. I understand that. But y'all have heard me before, and I have had people get mad at me, and I've had some church members leave this church. Because I have also said that we as believers have got to learn how to trust God. I have said it once. I've said it twice. I've said it many times. And I tell people, if you can trust God to take you to the football stadium, if you can trust God to take you to the concert, if you can trust God to take you to the store and buy all these Christmas gifts, why can't you trust God to bring you to the house of God? Oh, I've made a lot of folks mad, but I don't care. Because here is the thing. What God is looking at, God is not surprised by COVID. God is not surprised by any of this stuff. What God is looking for is to see are you still going to serve me? Or are you still going to trust me? Or are you going to trust yourself and what people are telling you? I tell you all the time, that's why I wear one of these. That's why I done had all three of them shots. That's why I'm cautious. However, as I've said before, the kingdom work of God has been given to the disciples of God, which is us. And kingdom work must go on. There are people that are dying, going to Christless graves. There, the suicide rate is up. The divorce rate is up. The alcoholic rate is up. Everything is up because people have lost hope. And nobody, when I said nobody, I don't mean nobody at all. I'm talking about in general, is there to give them hope. Nobody wants to be around anybody. How can you be a blessing to somebody if you're not around them? How can you minister to somebody if you're not around them? I thank God for social media, but let me tell you something. That is not God's model for discipleship. Social media is not God's model, amen, for the church body to be communicating with one another. The Bible teaches us that we have been told to go to one another, and if you're going to minister to me more effectively, you got to be around me. You got to spend time with me. And the church 
has gone to sleep. And we wonder, and I'm going to tell you, I believe in my spirit, God has laid all of this at the feet of the church. And the church has the greatest opportunity. If there ever was an opportunity, a mission opportunity for the church, it's right now where you have people who don't have no hope. And here you are, you're the one that can give them hope. You're the one that can come into their lives and begin to give them a future, something to think about other than how I can isolate myself. Jesus told his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. The church right now has the greatest opportunity to show Christ. But let me talk to you about your Kadesh moments. Because the, 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 the city of Kadesh and the children of Egypt are at Kadesh. Kadesh in this text from me represents those moments of decision. The children of Israel arrived at Kadesh Barne, and they sent out the spies. The spies brought back the report, and they now, as a community, had to make a decision. And that decision was, are we going to go in and possess the land, or are we not? And the Bible says that the people believed the ten and they chose not to believe God, and therefore they did not step into their destiny of blessing, and therefore God got angry. God got upset. And God called Moses and said, Moses, we need to talk. He said, Moses, how long are these people going to hold me in contempt? In other words, how long are they going to not believe me? I have led them from Egypt all the way here, and they still don't believe me. Why? You'd have thought, Moses, that they would have believed in me when Pharaoh was on their tail, the mountains was on both sides, the sea was in front of them, and I opened up the Red Sea, and they walked across on dry land, and when they got over, I then brought the waters back and drowned Pharaoh. You thought, Moses, they would have believed me. And if that wasn't good enough, Moses, when they didn't have nothing to eat, and they was complaining about nothing to eat. Guess what? I sent quail all over the place. I rained down this stuff that looked like cornflakes called manna. What is it? And they still ain't believing me, Moses. At what point, Moses, will they start believing me? And here's my question to us today. At what point will we start believing God? At what point are we going to start really believing God? At what point are we really going to start believing this book? And what God says. Because, see, what determines our actions is what we believe. i never forget, at the height of COVID, when it really got kicked off back in March of 2020, and, 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 and we, somebody asked me, because we were still, and uh, we had just really started up our Neighbor Feed Neighbor Ministry as far as going out. And we got these three teams, and my wife had a team, got a team, Sister Tanya got a team, I got a team. And they were going out, and somebody asked me, aren't y'all afraid to be going out there with all them people? Keep in mind, we're taking 300 and some meals on Tuesdays, 300 and some meals on Thursdays, and we're going to people we don't know. I'm going under bridges, back up creeks, people that don't have masks on and ain't vaccinated. And I remember thinking, oh, Lord, you got to protect us. And especially my wife, God, protect her. I wasn't really worried about me. But I was worried about her. And that was on my mind, and I was praying. And my wife said something to me, and some of y'all may have heard me say this. My wife said this. She said, these people have got to eat. And if that means that I'm going to catch COVID, then so be it. When she said that, I was fine with it. I said, God, if she is willing to trust you for it, I am too. And we haven't stopped. Now, what, what are you saying? See, what I'm saying is, now let me tell you something. I am not Superman. All right? I'm not super pastor. How many times have y'all heard me stand in this pulpit and pray, God, please protect us? While we are inside this small room, still trying to provide a place for people to come and worship in the midst of it. Oh, yes, because it stays on my mind. 
But I had to make a decision one day, Dennis, either you're going to trust God or you ain't going to trust God. If you ain't going to trust God, Dennis, quit preaching about it. Told myself, don't get up there yelling and screaming about God is able and trusting God if you ain't going to trust God. Yeah. So Kadesh in our lives are those moments of decisions whereby we're going to have to decide whether or not we're going to trust God. Now, COVID is just one thing, but I'm talking about anything in your life. I don't care what it is. When you are faced with a circumstance where you've got to make a decision, that is your Kadesh Barney moment. And you got to then decide, am I going to trust God, even though the majority says we can't do it? Am I going to listen to the minority that says we can do it? Am I going to trust and believe God or not? So what happened? The children of Israel, as I told you, they didn't believe God. And what happened? God got angry and God told Moses, Moses, because they did not believe me, all of those people over the age of 20 years old that left Egypt will not see the promised land. And the Bible says God calls them to wander around for another 39 years. The Bible says until that generation that left Egypt died off. That's why they wandered for 40 years. God did that. Literally, that journey from from, from Ramses to the promised land was just about like walking from going from here to, say, the Louisiana state line. That's how close their promise was. And they lost it because they wouldn't believe God. Some of you, God has such blessings waiting on you. You're just going to have to believe him. You're going to have to start learning how to trust him. You got to start learning not to depend on what your own thinking, but depend on what God said in His Word. Now, briefly, real quick, I want to show you three sins or three things, mistakes that cause the children of Israel to not inherit the promised land. And these mistakes are mistakes that we can make in our lives that keep us from the blessings of God. In the 14th chapter, beginning at verse number 1, that night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? or our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Look at this. Here's their first mistake. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? See, the problem and the first mistake they, they made was they start looking back at Egypt. Here God was trying to move them forward into the promises, but when times got tough, what did they do? They went back to the place of comfort because at least in Egypt, even though they were in bondage, they were eaten. At least in Egypt, even though they were in bondage, there was not a fearful of anything happening to them. And so they began to look back at Egypt, the place of bondage. How many times do I know people who God has been really trying to move them into spiritual maturity and spiritual growth, and when the circumstances of life hit them or the challenges hit them, they go back to their old ways. Go back to their old ways. It's a whole lot easier for me to go back to what I'm familiar with than for me to go to those unknown territories. Let me tell you something. You will never mature in Christ, and you will miss out the greatest blessing of your life until you're willing to go into uncharted waters, until you're willing to trust God. Oh, I tell people, y'all know me. I, I've gotten a reputation now as the, as, as the clapping pastor. Interesting, the other night, after the watch night service, Sister Timmons came up to me with Alicia's little girl and said, Pastor, she didn't learn how to clap like you. <laughs> That's what she said. And, 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 and I looked at it and she goes, like, I said, well, praise the Lord. That's the second person that my clapping done, ran, done, done rubbed off on. You know, I praise God that, you know, she looks at me as the clapper. 
Because number one, she only time she see me clapping is in the house of God. So what it does, and her little heart knows that when she get in the house of God, it's okay for her to <laughs> clap. Amen. Praise God. But, but, the, but the children of Israel, they missed out on the greatest blessing that God had for them because they believed the majority and they failed to take and claim the blessing that God had for them. Why? Because it was so much easier to go back to what I'm comfortable with. Yeah, church, y'all just don't realize that there is another level of existence that God want to take you to. And he wants to demonstrate who he is. But you got to be willing to take him by the hand and follow him. I remember when I was on the fire department. And, uh, you know, I'm, I've always been adventurous. adventurous. So uh, they established this dive team. Okay, Joe Poole Lake. I was on the dive team. And we used to go out and we used to practice. Now, I had never been scuba diving before in my life. You know, I, I had watched, you know, Sea Hunt. Some of y'all remember Sea Hunt. Lord Bridges, for some of y'all that's my age, y'all remember that? You know, you got down there swimming on the water and seeing all the pretty fish and all this stuff. And all. The and the first time I put on one of them suits and we got in Joe Pool Lake and we got off that boat, there's about 40 feet of water, and we went down and I'm expecting to see some stuff and it was pitch black. I couldn't see, I couldn't even see the compass so I can read uh, my compass uh, on my uh, gauge. It was that black. And now here I am. I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Well, my instructor that was with me, he kept going down. And I'm like, oh, well, no, no, I want to go back up where I can see. And he kept going down further and further and further. And finally, I just grabbed him like that. And I think I scared him half to death. And I said, I said, my, you know, I don't know anything about wading down off. It's black. I don't know where I'm going to. But let me tell you what, I'm, wherever you go, I'm going. Amen. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to follow you. I'm putting my trust in you. You're going to lead me down to the bottom because they would teach us. We'd go down to the bottom of the lake and sit down on the lake. On the bottom, 40 feet underwater. And I'm just as scared as can be. Now, when we got back up top, you know, you know me, you know, I played it off. <laughs> You know, I played it off. Hey, that's cool, you know. But I had to learn, I, I, you know, I was, dude, wherever you go, I'm going. I'm, I'm hanging on to you. That's what God wants us to do. God wants us to, when the times get dark, when we can't see, when we get afraid, he wants us to latch on to him. And don't go back to what's easy, because when you go back to what's easy, you're going to miss out on the blessing of what God has for you. So the first mistake was that they wanted to go back to Egypt. The second mistake was that they, 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 they looked around and they complained about their circumstances. How many of you are happy about being broke? How many of you, 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 you can really praise God when your um, bank account drops down to that, you know, single digit? And you know that if you allow it to stay at that single digit too, digit too long, the, di the, 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 the bank's charges is going to eat that up. How many of you can say, praise God, I got $5 in the bank? No, we don't do that. We don't do that. However, what do we do? When we don't have the things that we want, when we look at our circumstances, and we begin to complain. Look at verse number Five. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephthah, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land that we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land formed with milk and honey, and will give it to us. And look at verse 9. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land. They said, look, do not be afraid, and don't look at the people. Don't look at your circumstances. He said, if the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us. And too often, what we do is we miss out on the blessings that God has for us because we start looking at our circumstances. We start looking at the people around us. Well, some, of, some of us get just like Jeremiah did. Remember in Jeremiah, uh, when Jeremiah looked out there and he saw how all the wicked people were prospering? And Jeremiah went to God complaining? 
Jeremiah said, God, here I am trying to serve you. Matter of fact, some of us probably already have said this before because I've said it. God, here I am trying to serve you. I'm trying to do my best for you. I'm giving you everything. And then them people out there that don't even care about you, they always seem to be getting blessed. Got any witness in here? Any y'all ever, 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 ever done that? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but here I am. I'm, I'm going to church. I'm serving you. I'm loving people. I'm reading the Bible. I'm doing it. And my coworker down there who don't even care about you, don't even believe in you. Every time I look up, they getting something new. God looked at Jeremiah and said, Jeremiah, if walking with the footman weary you, how will you run with the horses? You know, God's response was not, Jeremiah, I ain't concerned about all that stuff. He said, but if you're going to trip out over the fact that some folks got stuff that you don't, then how am I going to be able to use you in the future to be able to bless people if this is getting to you? And then he says, if in the time of peace you stumble, he said, what you going to do when I trouble the Jordan? He told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, if you can't handle this, I can't use you. So if you are so focused on your circumstance and what you don't have, how can God use you? Don't you know some of the greatest people that God used had nothing but a love for God? And if you ever want to experience that supernatural peace of God in your heart, that part that the Bible talks about, he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or think. He ain't talking about giving you no new Mercedes. He ain't talking about giving you no whole lot of money. That ain't what he's talking about. He's talking about taking you to a level of living whereby you are able to be used by him because you are just like Paul said, that whatever state I find myself in, thereby I am content. And he said, and godliness with contentment is great gain. That's why God want to take you. You know, God, let me say this because I'm fixing it. And, and, and trust me, y'all, give me five more minutes I'll be through. Let me say this because y'all know I love you and I just get myself in trouble all the time. It's only because I love you. Okay. God has not promised everybody that they're going to have all these material blessings. <clears throat> let me say it again. God has not promised and is not obligated to make sure that you all have all this material stuff that the prosperity preachers are telling you you're supposed to have to be blessed. Because see, and, 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 and let me tell you something, the next time somebody get up there and tell you that God wants, your, wants you to prosper as your soul prospers, you need to, after it's over with, be respectful. Don't stand up in the middle of the service and say, oh, wait a minute. Pull him aside and say, uh, Pastor, can I help you understand a little bit better what that scripture is talking about? Because John is writing to a man named Gaius. And John, in that passage of scripture, is only giving a greeting. And that greeting is the same type of greeting. Y'all remember when we had snail mail? Y'all remember when we used to write letters? And we, how would you start out the letter? You know, dear so-and-so, I pray that all things are going well with you. That's all that is. That's not no general doctrine of prosperity. But I have heard preacher after preacher preach that and tell, see, the Bible says God wants you to prosper as your soul prosper. And now everybody going around up thinking, you know, I got to get this, I got to get this. Now, 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 don't misunderstand me. I ain't against nice stuff, okay? I ain't against nice things. All right, I've come to the conclusion that I'm not getting that bass boat that I've been telling y'all about for the last 10 years. All right, I'm satisfied. All right, I'm, I'm satisfied. Now, unless somebody just wants to make me out of a lie, amen, and go get me that Ranger bass boat, I will be more than happy to have it. But my point is, I don't need that stuff in order for me to be happy. I, I, I used to be very materialistic. My wife, I tell you. Y'all in the fire department, I had a contracting business on the side. I was making big money, good money. I'd buy anything I wanted to buy, materialistic. Walked into a uh, sporting goods place on Jefferson uh, one day in 1986. Saw a bass boat on the showroom floor, $12,800. I walked up to the salesman and said, I want that boat right there. 
The guy thought I was crazy. He said, well, we got some used boats in the back. I said, no, 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 partner. I want that boat right there. You know, the guy go, okay, well, uh, how are you going to finance? I don't worry about the financing, all right? I just want that boat right there. Materialistic. I was. Again, I ain't against people getting nice stuff. Get all the nice stuff you can, all right? But don't let that stuff get you. Don't let you think that that's, that stuff, you got to have that stuff in order for you to be happy. Okay? Because that's not how this works. Jesus says that a man's life does not uh, uh, the, uh, exist in the abundance of things he possess. So if you call up in your stuff and you ain't happy unless you got stuff, young people, listen to me. Okay? Family Dollar has got some nice tennis shoes. <laughs> see, how, see how these young people looking at me? <laughs> $13.99. I know. I got three pair of them. And they just as comfortable as can be. I look just as good in them as I would in a $200 pair, $200 pair, no, not $200, that was a long time ago, a $600 pair of Nikes. I look just as good. My feet are going to feel just as good. So don't get caught up in that stuff. That's the trick of the enemy. Society, public opinion that told us that in order for us to have worth, we got to have stuff. And we then let that stuff be what we get our worth from. And then we get caught in a trap. This trap of always trying to get stuff. Don't, don't, trust me, don't get me wrong. I like to have nice things. And let me tell you something. And when God blesses me with nice things and when I'm wise enough to know how to manage my money so that I don't take every single dime of my money and pay credit card bills, when I'm wise enough to put some money back so that when I want that nice thing, I just go to the bank and get it out and go buy it. Okay? Let me close. Don't look back. Don't look around. And here's the other one. Don't look within. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. Because this is interesting because in Numbers chapter 14, they are at Kadesh. In Numbers chapter 20, they are also at Kadesh, but it is years later. It is years later. So they get to Kadesh years later, and look at what it says. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh, and there Miriam died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead, before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this desert that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? And notice, it has no grain or figs or grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. They began to look within themselves at what they did not have. And they began to grumble and complain against Moses. And so God told Moses, okay, Moses, I heard him. I'm finna give them some water. What I need you to do, Moses, I need you to go up there to the mountain. I need you to get by the rock. I need you to speak to the rock. Tell the rock to bring forth water in the presence of the children of Israel. Let them hear it come out of your mouth. God said, bring forth water. Moses, by now, he's been dealing with these church folks for all these years. They're grumbling and complaining, and he done finally got upset. Now, I'm not going to get mad at Moses because I done done the same thing. And, and Moses gets up there, and instead of listening to God and telling the people what God told him to tell them so that God would be glorified, Moses got mad. Moses said, how long are y'all going to rebel against God? Do we have to bring forth water 
basically for y'all to be happy, I'm paraphrasing it. And Moses got so mad, got caught up in his emotions. You know what he did? He, he hit the rock. His emotions came out, and he struck the rock. And it brought forth water. But guess what? He accomplished what God told him to do, but he didn't do it God's way. And what did God tell Moses? Moses, you blew it. Because you didn't do it like I told you to do it, Moses, you and Aaron will not enter the promised land. That quick, that quick, Moses lost his opportunity to go to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. Why? He got mad. He got angry. And he didn't follow God's commands. What are you saying this morning, Pastor Webb? This is what I'm saying. We are at those moments of decision in our lives. We are at those Kadesh moments where you're going to have to choose whether you're going to believe God or not. And, and, and your choice will make you. You can choose to believe God just like Joshua and Caleb and receive what God has for you. Or you can choose not to believe God and suffer the consequences of what God had for you. I'm trying to get you to understand your Kadesh moment is 2022. I heard some people the other day, they put it like this. Oh, Lord, we got another 2022. In other words, the way they said it was that we got a second round of 2020. And they were said in such a way that they were dreading 2022. Why? Because they're looking at the circumstances. They are remembering 2018 when we weren't dealing with this monster called COVID. They are fearful of their future. And many have allowed themselves to forget that God is still on the throne. They've allowed themselves to forget what Paul told the Ephesus that we have a God that we can call him Abba, which means Father. They forget that God sits high and looks low and still controls everything. They forget what God told both Abraham and Jeremiah. Is there anything too hard for God? And so if you're sitting there fearful of what 2022 is going to bring, let me encourage you. Do like the psalmist. He said, I will look to the hills from which cometh my help. For my help comes from the Lord. I'm not going to look to the north. I'm not going to look to the south. To the east or to the west. He said, I'm going to look up. Because if I look to the south, I see people. If I look to the north, I see circumstances. If I look to the east, I see the stuff I don't have. If I look to the south, I see those diagnoses and I see those illnesses and all that. And so, therefore, I'm not looking at any of it. I'm looking up. And I'm putting my trust in God. And come what may. I'm going to be found faithful to God. The Bible says, Jesus said, when he comes back to the earth, will he find faith? Church, maybe you've struggled trying to trust God. Maybe you've struggled. That's okay. That's normal. We're human. God understands that. He understands that we're on this journey of faith. And he understands that we are human beings. But what God wants to do in our lives is demonstrate who he is, even right now. He can give you a life that's full. The Bible is really trying to teach us that we as believers, we got the promises of God that can cause us to live a very good life. Yes. Tragedy will strike. Things will happen. But in the midst of it all, 
in the words of Brother Haynes, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So trust God. Trust God. Stand to your feet. Trust God. Trust God. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, give it to God and say, Lord, I'm not picking it back up. God, I'm going to trust your word. I'm going to trust that you're able to take wherever I am, whatever situation that I find myself, and you can work it out for my good. Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and that are called according to his purpose. All things work together. But you just got to believe it. Father, thank you this morning, dear God, for this opportunity to be in your house. To be with God's people. To not only worship together, but to learn together. You've taught me so much over the last year. Leading a church through these unprecedented times. Trying to be faithful, dear God, not only to my family, but to your call. Trying to be there for people who are depending upon me, dear God. The phone calls that where people need encouragement and guidance. Thank you, dear God, that you kept me. And today, Lord, my prayer for those that are here and those that are watching online is that when we get to this moment of decision in our spirits, in our hearts, in those decision-making times, we will be the Joshua and the Caleb's to say that we can take it because the Lord is with us. Don't let us ever fall short of what you want in our lives by looking back and wanting to go back to that that's comfortable. Don't let us look around and see the circumstances and the people, but let us look up. Don't let us depend on our own desires. Because, dear God, there are some things that you just don't want us to have. But there's many things, dear God, that you have that's much better than what we desire in our own flesh. So, Lord, my prayer this morning, God, is that this word has permeated somebody's heart and will stay with them as they leave. But not only that, Lord, as they leave, they will go out and they will share it with somebody. Let them know that there is no reason to fret, no reason to doubt, no reason to look on 2022 in some kind of dim way. But Lord, let us burst forth, dear God, into the new year, knowing you're with us. But also knowing, dear God, that you got a mission for us, that there are people that need to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, to you be the glory and the praise. We ask it all. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.